attendants. Um, I'm very proud to introduce Shaban from Everdreamsoft in Geneva. Um, a long, long, long time ago, I, I read an article in Bitcoin Magazine about uh, somebody creating a game um, theming around blockchain and the creation of blockchain and, and themed this also in the artwork in the cards. And, you know, at the time I thought, okay, one of these other you know, maybe three, four hundred Bitcoin projects popping here and there and, and, and maybe they're successful, maybe not. And I uh, subscribed to the mailing list at the time and uh, I got updates every now and then. And those updates uh, contain like a little map with a, with a little hero and some, some waypoints and how they would reach them. And it was actually quite surprising to see that for such a long project, actually those waypoints were actually reached and when this game finally launched on April 20th, I thought we should invite um, the creators to actually show us this game, show us what they did and um, meanwhile they've also become a member of the Bitcoin Association Switzerland, Everdreamsoft uh, and we're also happy to announce this. And now the stage is yours, Shavon. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, hello everyone, uh, thank you for inviting me here in the heart of Crypto Valley. Uh, I'm actually very um, happy that things in the blockchain is moving a lot uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I think uh, that's really fantastic. And we're really at the beginning of something very big. Um, I like to be part, uh, play a little role in this whole revolution that just started yet. Um, yes, as I said, I'm the founder of Everdream Soft. I've fa founded seven years ago now. Uh, it's uh, still a startup in the spirit, but it's starting to get old to be uh, a startup. Uh, we're based in Geneva, uh, you know that place in the edge of Switzerland um, with a lot of strange people, uh, that's where we work. Um, in Lamuse, Lamuse is a co-working space, um, it's pretty really interesting and we've been there for, um, for seven years. So a bit of uh, history, so our first product at Everdream Soft was Moonga, a trading card game on mobile. And interestingly, at that time when we started in 2010, it was the very beginning of smartphone. It was the very beginning of the iPhone and the store, the app store, and it was fantastic, uh, the whole, how the technology evolved, the, the whole opportunity we got uh, on mobile. And Munga was one of the first game, there was not many games, but especially one of the first free-to-play game on the App Store. And at that time, we got a competitive advantage over other uh, games because Munga was a card game, a collectible card game, where people uh, can play for free and receive some free cards to play but there was also a way to purchase card, uh, in-app purchases, even a little bit before in-app purchases. So we had a competitive advantage because we had a free product. And at the same time, we got revenue from it. So comparing to the competition, we got a marketing cost that were much lower and um, still having uh, revenue. So it was um, a good opportunity for, for us at that time. What we learned from uh, our player, uh, Munga is a collectible card game, and some cards were very valuable in the game. Some are rare, some are very uh, desirable, and in order to get the legendary or mythic card, uh, you had to play a lot or purchase a lot of packs in order to have a chance to get uh, uh, those rare cards. Inside the game, there was a way to exchange card um, using a game currency, in-game currency. So basically, you play the game, 
you get game currency, and then you can trade the cards with other players with the in-game currency. And what happened actually? Uh, what happened is for trading cards, um, we didn't want people to use real money uh, in a sense to trade cards. Because if we allow them to trade cards with real money, um, we are becoming custodian uh, like a bank. We're holding things of value and people are trading it and for, for real money and meaning our database uh, are like a bank where we store uh, people uh, assets. Uh, and, and yeah, legally it's a little bit tricky. So the, the rules were you cannot trade the cards uh, with real, uh, real money. But people were doing it anyways. So what they do is they send money through PayPal, uh, Euro accounts, whatever, they make a deal. And then they make a little exchange transfer on the game with a very small amount, but the real uh, trade uh, was under the table. And then they contact the support sometimes and they say, oh, this guy has robbed me uh, this card, you see he, act, he hacked my account and he see, you can see he transferred this very rare card for a very small amount of, uh, of currency. So then they try to trick us in order to, uh, to get the card or scam people. So in a sense, uh, it's problematic for us because we're custodian of their value and we have the power to change the data on our database and say, okay, this guy has this card, he made a transfer, but we cancel it, and so on. So it brings some, some, uh, some problem. I mean, there was not, it was not that much of a problem in the game, but of course it was uh, an issue. And also something that we were thinking a lot, okay, we have this card, they have value, uh, we want people to trade them, uh, we want people to have things of value, but we cannot be custodian of their, their assets. After that, uh, 2013, 14, all games went free to play. Uh, the competition was fierce. Uh, right now there is about 300 games going out every day on the Android and uh, uh, iTunes store. So in order to get visibility, you need really a high budget or a high brand, uh, whoever Marvel or Lego or whoever has a very strong brand and a big marketing budget can make a difference in the game industry. As uh, a studio in Switzerland, um, we cannot compete directly with those big names. It was possible, uh, it was possible uh, several years ago. Today, um, it's not possible unless you come with something different, something new, and something uh, that has a lot of potential. So that's why uh, we started working on Spells of Genesis. Spells of Genesis is uh, a new game that we developed and the game itself um, is an arc, it's a mix between an arcade and a trading card game. So the first game, Munga, was more hardcore, I would say, for a strategic uh, game like Magic, for example, uh, Magic the Gathering for people who know it, uh, a little bit geeky game. Spells of Genesis is uh, simpler, so uh, I wanted my mother to be able to play it, and uh, that's why I wanted to mix a strategy, but also a very uh, simple game. An innovative game uh, economy and cryptocurrency, <coughs> as I said, we needed something different. We needed something that stand out, that is new and untouched by other uh, game publisher. I will tell you more a little bit after that. We use the blockchain for that, the Bitcoin blockchain. We're going to see it. The added value, the vision we sold to people is truly.
true ownership. True ownership of digital assets. The main difference between physical thing and digital thing uh, is usually digital things, you don't have ownership of them. If you go and buy a music CD, for example, in a shop, you go to the shop, you have the thing in your hand, you bring it back home, it's yours. You are free to give it, trade it, uh, sell it, do whatever you want with it. If you purchase something on iTunes, a song on iTunes, it's not yours. It's stored on Apple database or whoever owns it database and you just have a right to listen uh, to listen to it and if you die or or if you want to send it to someone else you just cannot so you will pay the same price as the physical thing but you don't have control over it so we've launched spells of Genesis uh, April this year so it's very uh, very new and um, before I go, I'll show you the magic behind. I just want to know um, who from you uh, is a beginner into the Bitcoin uh, uh, industry or... Okay, a few people. Um, so I'll go a little bit, uh, I'll go a little bit into it. Uh, I'll go, uh, I'll go a little bit deeper in the explanation of true ownership um, just before I show you the game. So the game itself is based on a fantasy, uh, fantasy landscape and it's a mix between a pool game, a snooker game and an RPG game. So you have these little enemies here and you have to hit them. So you, this is your character, and you're gonna shoot at them. And you need to maximal, maximize the bounces because the more bounces you do, the more damage you deal to the enemy. So you shoot, for example, with that guy. You will shoot here and try to find the right angle to hit maybe this one and this one at the same time. So your dexterity, agility. Uh, is important, but also your characters, because some characters have uh, different characteristics. Some are stronger, some shoot faster, some have specific spells. So you have really a lot of combination that you can do with your character in order to win uh, the levels. Those characters are cards. Uh, in your collection, so you can collect, uh, you can collect those characters. And like many other games, um, we store your collection, your character, in a database. So in our database, uh, when you get some card, you collect some card, we store them uh, in the database. The main difference is some of the cards here have a little crystal here. And those ones are not stored into our system. We give true ownership to the user. So there is two ways of owning cards. Some are in our database that we give for free, etc. And some are stored on the blockchain. So how does this work, storing on the blockchain? So I'll if, if you take Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself is a currency, um, or it can, it's a lot of things, but uh, it's also a token. And the main thing about Bitcoin is it's intrinsically, it protects the protocol, it protects about what we call double spend. And meaning that one Bitcoin can be only in one, the same Bitcoin can only be in one wallet. And if you send a Bitcoin to someone, you don't copy it. You take it and you give it to someone else. And 
two people cannot or two wallets cannot have the same Bitcoin. And that's completely different from what is usually the digital space, the internet space. Because if you have a song, an MP3 song, and you send it to someone else, uh, then you make a copy of it. So each time you, you send uh, the file, you can duplicate it. And the Bitcoin protocol allows uh, to send and transact and guarantee that one token is going from A to B and it's not duplicated. So that's the, that's the strength of Bitcoin and that's allow Bitcoin to be a currency because you cannot have a currency that is duplicable. So if, for example, I have a song or something of value or a token, uh, like an image of a token, and I say, okay, I pay you with that image or that song, you will say, no, it's not valuable because uh, you can make tons of copy. So the intrinsic, uh, intrinsic value of using Bitcoin protocol is that you protect from duplication. And that's what we do. Bitcoin do it for as a currency for people to transact a token of value. But we do the same with our game, our game character and our game assets. I'll explain you a little bit more um, about the card on blockchain. But before, I'll give you a little story of how we started with this vision. So, with this vision, um, we, we thought we saw an opportunity. We saw an opportunity in 2015. Um, there was a, a lot of people, less than now, but a lot of people interested with the blockchain technology. People who understand the value of having uh, a network, a protocol, uh, that's, that is protected against uh, double spend. So we decided to do a crowdfunding, uh, a crowdfunding, uh, selling the vision, telling people we're going to use the technology you love. We, we, of course, we targeted people who love Bitcoin, and we're going to use that technology to put game assets, and that's going to be truly revolutionary. Uh, because it will make a real change in the digital uh, entertainment industry. So what we did, we decided to issue our own currency, uh, BitCrystals. So the currency, why a currency? Uh, some people ask often, why don't you just use Bitcoin? Why a separate currency? We decided to create a currency because we wanted to do a crowdfunding. These days it's called ICO, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's very uh, but that's very popular. Um, but at that time there was not that much of uh, those uh, crowdfunding currency, but it was starting to be a, a movement. So we decided to create our game currency because we wanted to give people who participate to uh, the, the crowdfunding a share of the game, a share of the pie of the game. Because we believed that with this new technology, we can create projects where people who crowdfund, who participate, have a little bit of ownership of what they uh, fund. So we decided to create a currency uh, called BitCrystal and with those BitCrystal it's not to buy bread or, or, or uh, a beer in some restaurant but the, the goal of the currency is to buy games assets. So we told people if you buy our currency with this currency you can buy everything in the game. To simplify uh, everything in the game, every character, you will be able to buy with those currencies. Meaning, if you purchase part of this currency, uh, 
you, it's like you pre-buying whatever is going out in the game uh, in the future. So we did it. Um, we did it. So we decided to create uh, 100 million, uh, 100 million uh, big crystal in total. Uh, we sold. We we kept 15 percent for ourselves. I mean, for the development uh, budget and, and so on. And we kept another 15% that we decided that we're going to give to people for awareness and promotion. And the rest, we've put them on sale. And we say, okay, everyone who wants a little part of this game can pre-purchase the currency. Um, we end up, uh, and also we said, we said all the currency that are not sold in the pool during the crowdfunding will be destroyed. So it will be taken out from the market. Meaning that all people participating to the crowd participating to the crowdfunding, uh, they together have 70% of everything in the game. Why this is interesting to have uh, seventy percent of the game itself. It is interesting because maybe they will like the game and they will say, "Okay, I want to spend a, a little bit of my bit crystal, my currency in the game," or they believe the game will be successful and they will be able to resell this currency to other customers who are willing to uh, buy some characters. Um, we, sorry, that's a boring table, <laughs> but um, basically we distributed and we raised 974 BTC. At that time, that was around uh, 30,000, uh, uh, 300,000 US dollar around. Um, comparing to what is done today, it's not a real big deal, but comparing to game crowdfunding, that's pretty, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good score. We also uh, said some uh, specific things, like we said to people, if you participate now to the crowdfunding, you have some special package, and inside those special package, you have some rare and good cards. Uh, to play with. And cards, some cards that you can have only today. And that's one of the beauty of the blockchain is we can issue uh, cards and we can say that this card will be printed or issued a maximum of 300 times, for example. And then it's impossible, even for us, to create more. So we cannot dilute the value. So if we say this is a limited edition of 300 units, it's guaranteed by the protocol that it's no more than 300. So if you own one on the 300, uh, it means that uh, you are one among maximum of 300 people owning the car. And we say to people, that's valuable because they're collectible, they're an uh, interesting card, and they're going to probably be very valuable in the future. So, um, that's an interesting opportunity. This card, for example, Satoshi card, who is a representation of the, uh, the creator of uh, blockchain, um, is traded today um, among players for about 5,000 uh, 5, Swiss francs uh, around. Um, and that's the rarest, 300 units. And for a game that is relatively new, um, that's very interesting because this is a very high price. And um, for, for a game that, has, that is still at the beginning, it has no long history. And 
Why do people uh, pay 500, uh, 5,000 francs for a card? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. What, why would they do so? It's because since their unicity are uh, guaranteed by the, the protocol, when you buy one of those cards, uh, it's like an asset because it's yours, it goes to your wallet and you control it. There is no way we can cancel, we can remove your, uh, your asset from your wallet. Uh, people can verify that it's very unique. And that makes it valuable, because when you buy it, you know that you'll be always be able to resell it. Maybe the price will go lower, but at least you can uh, resell it, or you can give it, or you can do whatever you want. Um, so this is some cards that was being distributed, uh, Satoshi card, oops, sorry, during the, um, the crowdfunding. So for example, the Genesis card, all the card has a little history that is related to the blockchain or the Bitcoin history. So uh, Genesis card is a representation of the first block of the blockchain. Uh, here it is. Uh, the first block of the blockchain, so we created an allegory saying there is a, a, a mountain where there is miners uh, and they are mining the blockchain. Uh, in order to make it m more simple and understandable for, for a mainstream user, the ones that we are targeting today, because we started with Bitcoiners and now we want to go to mainstream users. So. How does it work? Um, as I said, there is some cards that you can get for free easily by playing the game. But there is also cards that are limited and they are on uh, the blockchain. And that you can buy using your Bitcoin, uh, your Bitcoin wallet. And those cards are sold only for BitCrystals. Sometimes we accept Bitcoin and we do special offers. But as we promised at the beginning, every card that we create every week um, are purchasable with the crystals. So whoever per, per has the crystal can buy cards. Also, we have a kind of a revenue share uh, with people who purchase, who not only people who bought the crystal at the beginning, but for everyone who owns BitCrystal, we have kind of a revenue share. So anyone can participate, can be stakeholder in uh, Spells of Genesis by owning BitCrystals. And how the revenue share uh, work? Um, at the beginning, we wanted to give to all people who own BitCrystal um, depending on the percentage of the total they own, uh, maybe a part of the revenue. So when people give money uh, to us, we redistribute half of the money to BitCrystal holders. Legally, it was tricky because um, then it's a kind of a revenue sharing and uh, uh, to comply to the laws and rules um, that would have been uh, impossible. So what we decided to do is we, each time someone buys a card from us, we destroy, we burn uh, half of what they get, gave to us, uh, we destroy it. Meaning that we make the bit crystal rare, rarer and rarer, uh, scar scarce and scarce, by destroying a little bit of the supply. And by destroying a little bit of the supply, makes everyone else uh, holding a little bit more valuable. So the more people get the card, purchase, uh, the more valuable it gets the big crystal. Yes? So here's a question. So if, you distribute, if I am to correct you, you take away part of your currency and uh, the uh, play goes on, so the game goes on, which means that like, you push your own risk of like, not having no liquidity at the end. Yes, um, it, is, it is possible. Uh, first of all, we issue 100 million, so 
we still have margin. And then there are also, just like Bitcoin, there are um, divisible uh, to nine, uh, nine position up to zero. So you can have 0 0.000001 bit crystal. Um, of course, it's less handy to have like such a small numbers, but this is a problem that could occur in the future. So, but in the future, we're gonna see how we're gonna take care of that uh, that situation. You can maybe set the color the card lower or higher. The change of the card will maybe change if you don't have but enough currency at the end. Yes, what happens actually is uh, the following. So. The more card we sell, the more valuable gets the currency. And then, um, when we started, one big crystal was 0.01 francs, and now it's 0 0.7, uh, 6, depends, change. But meaning that the cards we were selling at the beginning, we were selling them for 600 big crystals, and now the new ones are sold for much less because the currency uh, is much more valuable. Yes. So, so you adjust the price um, that you that you want for a new card based on the current value of Bitcoin. Right? Exactly. So, right. Okay. Then I don't understand the value proposition for the rise because you um, at the same time when you when you say you uh, you destroy or burn um, bit crystals, uh, but at the same time you you lower the price uh, in bit crystals for for buying new ones. So you you also take away the uh, the need for spending. Bit crystals in the same way as you burn something. Yes. Why would that lead to a rise in price? So, um, what we do is um, the cars that are set price uh, in big crystal, uh, like the ones who were sold two years ago, will never go down in price. So, <clears throat> if you buy the cards today, uh, if you buy the card today, um, and the price of Big Crystal goes up, the, the card will remain very expensive. So your, so your cards that you purchase um, start, starts to be much more valuable. So meaning that the, it's better to buy a card when it's released uh, than waiting because um, when it's released, let's say there is uh, 100 people who are interested and a hundred people buy the card. So it will basically be the total supply of that card if only 100 people buys it. And uh, meaning that if, as the game gets more popular, um, the, the, the value of your card will, will be more, um, more important. Right, so I understand that the value of the card um, rises, but the value of bit crystals, probably not by that time. But maybe we can discuss this later. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, to discuss the uh, the economy uh, afterwards. But that's that, that's um, I will say what is very interesting here because it, it's very new. Uh, it's a very new concept, and um, we are exploring it and um, discovering as we go. Is the analogy like share by value? It's like you're taking tokens out of circulation. Yes. And thereby increasing the value of a single token. Yes. That's the same value now to do to this question, I think, right? Yeah. So you're transferring wealth from savers and big crystals by destroying your own savings and big crystals, if you will. Yeah. Your own, the one that you, you, you get from revenue, you, you're taking out of circulation. Yeah. Therefore, increasing the value of those of others. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Thank you. So, so yes, um, to, to synthesize that, basically, people. When they purchase a card, they give us back the bit crystals, and with those bit crystals that they gave us back, we take uh, half of it out. So meaning that as they purchase, at the end they will run out of bit crystals, so they will, they will have to purchase more. And those uh, who want to purchase more, uh, they are more scarce, and then the, the price, um, the price then goes up. But we'll discuss it a little bit uh, after. <clears throat> the swap bots. So we are using uh, counterparty technology uh, for people who knows a bit of blockchain 
there is different technologies. There is Bitcoin, there is Ethereum, uh, and there is a lot of other um, other technologies and systems. Um, what we use is Counterparty. Uh, Counterparty is handy uh, because it's simple to issue token. Um, it's simple to issue token. There is a decentralized market, meaning there is a market where people can trade their, their card um, working on mobiles and working on, on different platforms. It's, uh, it's straightforward. So basically, if I want to purchase a card here, I'll just uh, click I want to purchase. I will enter the number of cards that I want to, uh, to, to purchase. It will show me a QR co code. And just like sending Bitcoin, I will be able to send uh, the currency to the merchant, and the merchant will send me back the card in, uh, in my wallet. So it, it works uh, just like Bitcoin, pretty uh, straightforward. We also, one of the important things is transparency. Uh, transparency to our users. And um, this is a bit maybe an important, uh, an important thing. On a lot of projects that are on the space uh, who create their own currency uh, for the one uh, knows, they have a lot of value uh, for the currency. And the, where does the value of the currency comes from? It comes from the hype of the project and the speculation. Um, of course, we play a little bit on the speculation, but for us, what is very important is the market proof. A market proof is how many users want to use your currency because they have the benefits, they want to consume the benefits, and not how much people uh, are willing to buy because they want to speculate. So that's very key to our strategy since the very beginning. So the currency we issued, we, from day one, said, okay, we, you have this currency, but what you can do is it not just speculate, but you can really get a game asset and start playing with it. So in our user base, uh, we have a lot of people um, who actually buy the currency because they want the card, they want the character, they want to play. And the market proof is the most important proof um, for a cryptocurrency project. And this is my personal opinion. Um, I think what's happening in the space right now is all the crowdfunding and ICOs is really overinflated comparing to the real market demand because what makes the value of a project is how much people desire the currency because they have a need for it and not the whole speculation around. So maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but on the strategy um, that we always had is we publish uh, the number of burned bit crystal that's our revenue, it's meaning how much people are buying, how many cards people are buying to us every month. And um, we, we sold for about uh, 300,000 uh, francs value of cards. And I think that's more than the, what's the value of BitCrystal and is it going up, is it going down. That's the, the most important thing is how many users are buying cards because they want to play with it or they want to um, collect them because it's good for, for them. So we issue a statement every month on how many cards we've sold and uh, the value of the crystal we burned. So the technology we're using is kind of party. I'll, I will not uh, talk much about it right now, maybe after our questions. Um, the other product we have, um, 
we've said that we want a product where people play, enjoy, and um, consume, actually. And also we are targeting users that are not familiar with, necessarily familiar with Bitcoin. Uh, some of us, like me, uh, I'm a technology fan and I learn about Bitcoin and I like it. We're targeting people who are gamers, they don't necessarily know about Bitcoin, but once we tell them the cards you purchase to us belongs to you, and that's a big, big added value. Because you are free to do whatever you want with your card. You can trade it, send it, uh, sell it. Uh, it's yours. And I believe that the future, uh, I believe that in five years, no one will accept to buy something digital where they don't have their ownership. And because blockchain can allow that, um, I guess it's going to uh, develop much further. So, I invite you to try Book of Forbes. Um, Book of Forbes is a wallet that we created. It's a Bitcoin wallet, a place where you can store your Bitcoin. But you can also store game cards, different game cards and different uh, assets. So, um, it's a little bit more visual. Um, they're represented as uh, cards or a character, but basically it's digital assets. And you have a marketplace um, because people want to trade and they can trade the card in a decentralized way. So it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So once someone gets a card, he's free to transact with anyone in the world and it's not going through our servers. So it's from one person to the other on an on on open market and we're not in the center of the transaction. So for, for example here, if I want to get this card, I can see seller's offers and buyer's offers. So sellers are, for example, selling for 31 WCN, who is another game currency that are uh, following our lead and uh, joins the platform. Um, what is interesting with that is, this is Spells of Genesis, this is our cards. And once you link your wallet to the game, the cards that you have on your wallet appear in the game. So each user connect his wallet. The game looks, okay, what do you have in your wallet? Okay, you have the Satoshi, you have the Satoshi, okay, it's activated here. You have this one, then it's activated here. So you can connect your wallet to the game. And then play the character. And um, also, interestingly, um, you can, one character, one asset, can be used in multiple products, in multiple games. So this is another game, uh, the B1, Sarutobi, that's not done by us. But he says, okay, whoever owns a Satoshi card uh, has the special character in my game. So he, he does some cross-marketing. Uh, that's good for us because we are the seller of the Satoshi card, so in, in a certain way it gives more value to what we produce and he uh, gets free marketing for, from people who are playing our game. Yes? Um, so that's, that's pretty cool, I think. So do I understand that correctly? If I create a game with different rule sets, I can still leverage your game assets? And I can also maybe interpret the attributes differently if I wanted to. Exactly. And, and if he shows that little card there in the top right, where does he pull that PNG from? Is that from your server? Or? Yes. So if you take the image, in terms of right management, yeah. um, the assets are open, uh, and asset is just a name. Uh, so he can show a different picture if you want. He can show a different picture. If he wants to use the same artwork, he needs to ask the permission to do it because artworks are copyrighted. But he can decide to use our asset that is free uh, to display com something completely different. And he can, he can do it. But of course for us it's, it's cool to have some synergies and 
uh, allow him to use that in order to, to grow the ecosystem. And another use case is that Takara game. Um, it's like a Pokemon Go where you can collect assets. Um, so basically you can put uh, an asset in Zurich and you can go and place and take it and it goes to your wallet. And um, it's good for marketing. Uh, Japanese companies are using it a lot uh, to make like uh, promotion tokens that gives whatever reduction or whatever um, added value. Uh, people go there and collect the, the tokens. Um, how, uh, how much time do I still have? As much as you like, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell me if I'm too worried. 45 minutes in. <laughs> um, so th there's other uh, projects who joined Buka Forest, like <laughs> Rare Pepe. Um, it, it's in this project is very interesting because uh, this is a completely user-generated content. So everyone in Rare Pepe uh, can create his cards and uh, submit to to whoever made the validation. And basically he creates his token and say, okay, I created an, an image and I distribute, I distribute it to whoever I want. So they, they can sell, trade, uh, whatever, but that's their creation. And uh, there is a real economy. People are buying tokens from other people because they want to collect them. And um, some are valuable because they're cool and, and rare. So, our strategy, uh, Avadrain Soft, is we want to create the tools for digital asset management. We have to <coughs> rethink everything because selling digital, uh, digital assets on blockchain acts like physical goods, like you have a stock, so if you get robbed uh, of uh, some amount of card, um, it's just like people went and robbed some physical thing because they're valuable and unduplicable. So if you're robbed, you're robbed. Or if, you, if uh, someone transfer an asset, uh, an employee to himself, for example, uh, that's something of value. And all, all of that requires accounting and really new tools that was never there before because we've never managed digital uh, property or digital thing the same way we we um, manage physical uh, physical assets. And so what's next? When we came with the idea of true ownership, um, we thought that's the beginning of something. We thought that in a few years, all digital product will issue their, their asset on the blockchain. And um, some of us, some people follow us, uh, like Beyond the Void, uh, we help them. Uh, they also made a game using digital assets, completely different. It's a uh, MOBA with spaceships. Um, it's a completely different game, but they also do uh, use digital assets on blockchain. Uh, they're using Ethereum. And another one is uh, Augmenters. So, Maybe people who are in Bitcoin knows uh, Vini. Um, so Vini was a buyer of, uh, of uh, a big crystal spells of Genesis. And he's also an investor in Shark Tank. And um, there was a people, a company, uh, two, two guys in a startup uh, on television. Shark Tank is a television show where entrepreneurs show their project to investors. And uh, Vini told them, okay, I invest in your project, but uh, use digital assets. Use, uh, look at whatever Spells of Genesis did and do uh, the same. And uh, they actually did the same way, like burning and all the rules that we use for crowdfunding, they, they, uh, they use it. And we help them also for that, because uh, I think we're at the beginning of an ecosystem, and that's what we're uh, trying to build. Um, 
So the big next step, I cannot um, give you uh, much information um, right now because I'm going to have an announcement next week um, really on what's next. So true ownership was something and uh, now we want to build something new, uh, and not a new vision but the next step of that vision and um, I invite you if uh, you'll be available uh, in Geneva uh, next Thursday. Um, also, even if you cannot join, uh, I invite you to download Spells of Genesis. It's free. Um, you can play it now. You can tell your mother uh, to play it. Um, and I invite you to test Book of Forbes wallet because uh, thanks to Ben, we got a very nice idea. We decided to issue cards uh, specially for meetups. So it's a card that in Spells of Genesis that you can only get in the meetup uh, groups. So I have some of those cards. So just create a wallet, Book of Forbes, right now, and I'll send you uh, one card to each of you. And um, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't forget to do that because they might be valuable, uh, collectible. And um, there's a lot of people that when I started, I told them, okay, I'll give you a free card, uh, whatever. And they'll say, ah, no. Uh, and, um, and then it ended up being very valuable. So um, take this opportunity, I give it uh, to the card for, uh, for free, so it doesn't cost anything. Uh, Book of Forbes. It's not written here. But on Book of Forbes, you can download the. Uh, yeah, there's a wireless code uh, in the front there for the user data. There. Yeah. So Book of Forbes is, for the one who never had a Bitcoin wallet, it's a good starting point because it's also a Bitcoin wallet. And, um, and um, you can just send asset the same way you send uh, Bitcoin. So that's it. Uh, a little bit, pre a little preview of our, our team uh, in Geneva, but also in some different places of the world. And that's me. Uh, that's me. If you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, we're all social media. If you're interested to you know more about all this uh, digital assets and what we can do with. Um, blockchain that is not necessarily monetary but another use, I invite you to, uh, to uh, follow us. Questions? Yes. I have several, but uh, maybe the ones which others won't uh, uh, say. Are you aware of Game Orbital from Bitforge? Yep. Okay. I know it and I know Reto very well. Okay. And for the story, um, Spells of Genesis was, at the beginning, we wanted to do it together, like mixing Orbital with uh, Munga, who's our previous game, having some, uh, some uh, characters. But in the end, we, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they decided not to proceed, so we uh, separated. I'm really excited about the digital ownership because I'm personally on time player of Magic the Gathering and then, for instance, if you buy Magic Online cards, basically in the terms of service it says you have a license to use digital objects. You don't even own them in their own terms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In addition to the fact that you don't own it because it's just bits in database, they can change, but even legally you're not entitled to any ownership. So this is completely the opposite end of the spectrum. Basically, you physically, you technically guarantee that ownership. Exactly. As long as you exist, of course. And we, we cannot blame Magic the Gathering because uh, if they gave you the ownership, um, they will be custodian 
of uh, your asset because they're using the database. Meaning that uh, what, whatever you own, is they're acting like a bank because they store the data of yours and that's legally pro problematic. But if, if you issue cards and then give to the user and then you don't control it, you did really give you ownership. Yes? Um, I'm super excited about the idea you guys have where you can share assets between different games. So my question is, um, uh, since you guys create the assets, if other games want to create their assets as well, what's the governance there? Because I'm presuming you want to release certain cards and certain properties onto the into circulation. I'm sure you have a roadmap or um, a way to govern that. But if another developer partner comes along and they want to create another game, which is your assets, do they also have the ability to create assets? So can you have both your side? And, and if so, how do you cover that? Anyone can create assets, uh, the assets he, he likes, but it's up to the product to choose which asset he wants to make available and what's the property of his assets. So you can really imagine a lot of use cases. For example, I'm a musician and I produce music and I can say, okay, I give the right to use my music to whoever uh, own the asset and the game or a movie or whatever could take this asset and say okay I have this asset and now I play the music so it's really up to uh, the, the person who used the asset to do whatever he wants with it and it's a collaborative so I, I can publicly say okay I give the right to whoever has that and, um, and someone can use that as well so over time a, a one game could leverage apps from four different other creators. Yeah. Which would seem like it could be a whole mix yeah. of assets. And to give a little glimpse, uh, that's a little bit the direction we're we're going okay. uh, so we're in the direction. Uh, yes. So um, this direct ownership is of course fancy and probably the reason why most, most of us are here. But um, how many requests did you have to people that did not understand that? and lost their private keys to the counterparty wallet and whom you had to tell, tell there was no way for us to recover what you lost. Does that happen? How often does it happen? Um, that was really an issue that we were uh, scared of uh, from, from the beginning uh, because true ownership of assets, uh, people are not used to it. So people are used to have something on a website and forget the password, whatever, and go to the website and ask for recovery. And of course, if you have true ownership, no one can recover what you own uh, except you. So that was something we were afraid of. And actually, interestingly enough, we didn't have um, any, uh, I think, uh, request or I will say bad request someone who lost something of uh, a lot of value um, we didn't have any yet we put a lot of warnings etc but of course people don't read the warnings but in Book of Forbes you have a very strict warning um, we don't have that much of that problem we have other problem uh, with blockchain uh, mostly people don't understanding how to get Bitcrystal how to get Bitcoin uh, why transactions are taking so long. Um, we have a lot of issues, but this issue, um, interestingly enough, it's not the, uh, the worst today. It wasn't. Uh, as for today, we never had someone who really lost a lot. It will happen, of course. But... <laughs> yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I have a question. Uh, I did install the game and play it and uh, connected my counterparty address to, um, to the game. But when doing so, if I remember correctly, uh, it just uh, on the website asked me, so please enter your counterparty um, address here. I did it and then I had the, um, the assets in the game. Awesome, simple, but I'm wondering the counterparty uh, addresses are publicly um, visible on the blockchain. So you don't seem to have a verification that the address that I entered is actually my address. I could just have looked up some address which has a lot of 
um, assets that I want to play with in the game, I would not have been able to, to, have to claim the ownership of those. I would not have been able to sell them on or steal something, but I would have been able to play with assets so that actually somebody else owns. Yes, that, that's something that um, we get a lot of requests uh, about that. Um, we can verify, uh, and we are rolling an update where we verify uh, with Book of Forts. Uh, there, there will be a signature uh, inside the app with the private key to verify that you are the owner of the asset. So technically it's possible to do, a, do that, but we didn't uh, use it a lot. Um, because uh, we, we didn't put it in high priority because the uh, simple reason is one address can be used only once. And usually people who have their address linked, they have it already. And if you take someone else's address, then maybe he cannot register this address, but it's not a good idea for you because one, he can move to another address and link. Second, the reward you get by playing the game, sometimes you receive some blockchain thing, will go to his wallet. So it's not necessarily a, a good idea to do it, but of course the cleanest way is to verify that you are the, the real owner. Yeah. Do you think that you can do the certification process in a way that is easy to do for your mother? Yes. So we, we have that in Book of Forbes. So um, basically it opens Book of Forbes, Book of Forbes signs uh, a message and sends it back to, uh, to Spells of Genesis. So basically it's just one button, uh, go back and forth and, and that's it. Technical question, how do you store the assets on the Bitcoin blockchain? Are you using like color coins protocol or...? Yes, we're using uh, Counterparty. Um, Counterparty um, is like a colored coin uh, protocol but uh, different. Basically, when you do a transaction on the blockchain, meaning when you send for people who, who, don't, who don't know much, about a Bitcoin transaction, basically you write uh, you write the command like uh, the number of Bitcoin you are sending, and this is stored on the on the book that's the blockchain. And um, in that book, where you say, okay, I send one Bitcoin to from Frank to Bob, for example, uh, there is also additional space to um, uh, write other kind of data. Uh, arbitrary data. So when I do a transaction uh, with Bitcoin, uh, counterparty protocol, the, co the protocol we're using, is writing some more data and say, say okay, you send 0.0002 Bitcoin to Bob, but you also sending a, 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 a blue dragon, for example, or a white dragon. Um, and those additional information are part of the counterparty protocol and that's where you could, um, for example, issue an asset representing your house, for example. So if you sell your house that is uh, very valuable, you'll, you're going to send a tiny fraction of Bitcoin and additionally you'll put the information, this is my house and uh, with this transaction it's transferred. So, uh, from, from a protocol level, is adding some more metadata on the blockchain. But from the user point of view, he sees assets going from uh, A to B, and you need to pay the Bitcoin miner fee uh, for the transaction, and also what we call the dust, so you need to send a tiny fraction of Bitcoin uh, to the receiver, um, that is, in fact, the transaction of the assets. One last question, really quick. You go out of business because the value of the card is also there will be here in 50 years or maybe 20 years. I mean, you go out of business, the assets, the picture I save on your server, it's off-chain. Most of the assets are off-chain, no? And when you burn, you burn because you are controlling the network. So if you go out of business, who is doing, it, doing your job of burning a uh, bit crystal? So if we go out of business, uh, basically what will happen is probably uh, Bitcoin, Bitcrystal will go down. 
but uh, from other projects that went out of business, uh, the history shows that usually their coins go down, but there are still people who trade it. I'm just asking if the system will continue to work. If I, we still have my cards because they're set in blockchain, but I can still exchange or still, you know, all yes. the, all the um, system around. So the technical system the counterparty market. is not our system, so it's an open source uh, protocol layer on top of Bitcoin, and it survives as long as at least one user uh, has a node uh, of the system. So the, if we go out of business, the asset stays and the information stays forever. Uh, but you will be still able to trade the cards, but of course they will be useless. But maybe people, and I, and I hope that uh, in 50 years people will collect uh, the Satoshi card, for example, in museum or, or whatever, and saying, oh, that was the first... I also think so, I just want to understand what the boundary are of the system, you know? Because yeah. with normal physical cards, you put them in a safe and someone found them or resells them and... Yeah, but with digital assets, which are really in the system, something can happen bad and so up. Well, there, there is still a rate of degradation, right? So, the digital is not degrading. Yeah, yeah, it's not degrading, <laughs> but degrading <laughs> if interest, you know? So, so basically, as long as the Bitcoin blockchain is alive, um, the information uh, is still there. If blockchain disappear, then... But it's more the way you interpret the data, say, in the blockchain. You, mean, you say it's a blue dragon. You, mean, you yeah. need the representation of a blue dragon, you know? Yeah. And this is not on the chain. So you only said metadata on the chain. Exactly. Linked to a system. And my question, you are using what behind? So, so it's PSS, whatever, to say this. I mean, this is also valuable, no? Yes. So if you talk about the image and all the whole thing, it's it's using the same old internet, whatever cloud uh, we call it these days. But um, what's what stays on the blockchain is really the, the this very small metadata representing something. And this small metadata, you can make it represent anything. Um, you can say this represents uh, this dragon or this whatever, but really what is existing is the, the, the real small metadata. So the question is where we need to go in direction. So now we have several projects in every green software, right? And yes. basically the, the crystals in the crowd sale you, you sold to supporters of Stealth Genesis, right? So how, first of all, how do you separate, let's say, revenue streams and so on from Spell's Genesis with all the other consulting and projects you're doing? Uh, is, is that a separate thing in, in, in the books, basically? And the, and the second question would be, what's the roadmap for, for Spell's Genesis? How, what's your viral stream, how it could grow, and with what features, and what are actually features which are coming on for, for those people having big crystals and so on. So, in, in, in terms of uh, big crystal holders, um, unlike uh, shares of the company, uh, currency has no uh, legal binding. Uh, and that's what happened in every project. What we do at Everdreamsoft is we want to work on the best interest of everyone. We believe in the, um, the group, uh, the power of the group and the supporters. And we are, we are having a roadmap, and I cannot tell much more about the roadmap, but basically we want to expand that, what we did to other products, other games, other publishers. So just what we have to give it to other publishers. And once we're going to do that, once we're going to announce that, we're going to bind that to BitCrystal in order to have all people who believe in us, who follow us, uh, have an interest into promoting, into continuing doing what we are, um, I mean, becoming a fan and follow the, the vision step ahead because we want to keep people who were believers uh, since the beginning involved. Because, of course, if we shift our business out of BitCrystal, 
we might uh, have problem because people will be mad, etc. And, and that's not really good and people won't trust us anymore. So on our roadmap and strategy, BitCrystal will always be um, a center point of, um, of what we do. Uh, yes? Two very technical questions, but you're very welcome to deflect them to a private discussion afterwards because maybe not everybody can. So let me give a brief version of the question. Um, so first, what happens um, if Bitcoin falls? Because then there are two forks and you would have to decide uh, which of the two forks do you uh, do you honor the, uh, the, the in-game asset? So, this is not such a big deal as if you would buy your house to, because it, it is possible to, to do it twice, but it's probably a decision that you might have to make very soon. Yes, um, good question. I'll take your question after that. Uh, <laughs> uh, fork. We. Um, does, who doesn't know about the fork that might happen in? Bitcoin. It's actually a chain split. <laughs> yeah. So one one of the big 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 problem that we're have facing is the the fact of transact transacting card is is super is great. People are doing it. Recently, um, the the blocks the blockchain are too full, and uh, there is. Too much demand of transaction um, that the the blockchain can handle, meaning the fees that we pay for transaction <coughs> was ridiculous. One cent to sending a card, too expensive, and that's a big hurdle uh, for everyone, but especially for us because our business is among trading a lot of assets and. Um, and the fee that we have to pay, um, sometimes five dollars uh, per one transaction, and also we want to reward people, uh, players, when they play, reach a certain level, we want to give them blockchain cards uh, to incentivize them. And we can't, I mean, it, it's starting to be a, a big hurdle um, because five dollars per transaction is too much. So. There is different uh, solution. Uh, I mean, there are people. There, there is simple solution, but to uh, to make Bitcoin scale and go back to a reasonable fees, but people are not agreeing on um, the way uh, the solution needs to be implemented, and that's for several years now. That uh, it's a known problem, but people don't find any consensus, and we need to find a solution quickly. Uh, Either the, the chain fork and the, the solutions comes because um, um, one of the fork is going better and, and the fees are good. But if this happens, um, we need to follow first counterparty because we're using counterparty protocol and it really depends on what chain they're going to be on. And I discussed with them and I, they said they're going to follow uh, Core with one proposition and I said what if Core dies and uh, they have a contingency plan uh, to, um, to go to another chain so basically take a snapshot of all the holdings and moving to another blockchain. So basically we're dependent on their decision. Um, it's easy to migrate from one to two. The problem uh, would be to be on only one, uh, uh, and then they are, uh, it seems that they're they're following core. Um, but for us, we're also exploring other technologies right now, uh, like e Ethereum and uh, whatever, um, because we need to quickly find a solution uh, of the scaling problem. And um, and yeah, that, that's that's really on top of the list of the thing. That's are very uh, strategic and critical right now. <laughs>